Our next speaker is Dr. Marcello Ucci, who is a senior lecturer here at the UCL Institute. Two sheets, excuse me, for environmental design and engineering. She's the course director of a brand new MSc program in health, well-being, and sustainable buildings. Her research focuses on the interactions and tensions between sustainable building design and operation, and the needs of occupants in terms of comfort, health, and well-being. Marcella is the chair of the UK Indoor Environments Group, the deputy editor of a number of journals that include Indoor Built Environment, and she's also a member of the, the executive committee of the UCL, UCL Centre for Behavioural Change. And she's going to discuss, I've got a different title on my sheet than you have, so maybe you'll introduce it. Sometimes, and 
where Latin facility managers get built in. But in fact, we need to collaborate with those sorts of other professionals, and that's quite challenging. Um, and in this respect, we should also remind ourselves that uh, often we tend to forget the very important role of factors such as behavior and perception. So how the behavior of people in the uh, in buildings affects our exposure is very important. The obvious example is you know, the, the, the ventilation and heating behavior, but uh, we should also talk about the behavior not just of building occupants, but also facility managers, um, uh, homeowners and uh, developers, etc. And how the perception of risk, for example, may affect certain things. Uh, it's very important to remind ourselves that some, uh, some environmental parameters we may be aware of the risks and, and aware of the exposures, but for, for others we're not. Uh, and so really we need to have both uh, experts who understand all of the nitty gritty details of what this graph means, uh, which requires really uh, new um, expertise and uh, abilities to work uh, in transdisciplinary ways. Uh, one example of how, uh, for example, the physical and the social environment affect people is some preliminary findings of a research project that I've been involved with called the active buildings. It's looking at whether office buildings layout may impact the physical activity and sedentary behavior of office workers. So in simple terms, we were looking whether the relative spatial distribution of things like printers, toilets, and coffee machines, etc., may affect how people walk around the office and sit and stand. And our preliminary findings suggest that people, people walk less if those hot spots are further away from them. Uh, moreover, uh, people walk less if uh, they perceive that management discourages unscheduled breaks, and also if people can see a lot of their co-workers from their workstation. So in this sense, there is, a, there is a sense that perhaps people may feel discouraged from moving too much because they might be perceived of not working enough. Of course, you know, it depends on the type of work that we do as well. But as built environment professional, therefore, we should always remind ourselves that we shouldn't ignore the uh, behavioral and social environment when we design for the physical environment. And often we're not trained for doing so. We, we are not <coughs> trained around you know, what is the temperature, what is the CO2, uh, and perhaps not so much around other aspects. Uh, and we should also consider that, of course, uh, when because health will be productivity and performance are, are such broad terms. They, they do get um, studied and addressed by different stakeholders in different ways. And understanding their priorities and their viewpoints is absolutely fun fundamental to ultimately make real impact on the ground and also developing in the business case. Uh, so there is, at the moment, really still a gap when it comes to the business case and the value case of health and well-being and performance in buildings, often because the meanings of health, well-being, performance is quite different across the region. Stakeholders and also not similar between energy uh, phenomenon. Uh, people who have to invest in, for example, health and well being may not be ultimately those who benefit. And so, how do you build the business case is different, also in different um, type of buildings, whether they're owner occupied or not, whether they're residential and non residential. Um, and uh, we, as built environment professional, uh, I, you know, there are so many events around health and well being in buildings. And Show, you know, which indicates that we think buildings play a big role. However, this um, uh, survey of general practitioners, pediatricians, and psychologists in the US suggests that not everyone believes that buildings play such a big role. And um, we need to understand those perspectives. They might be due to the sort of trainings that uh, you know, physicians have. And of course, there, is, there are scales effects. You know, I, I say to my students, if, if a client comes to you and says, design me a healthy home, you say, I'll do my best, but first stop smoking. Um, um, we should also remind ourselves that this is a very deeply linked agenda with sustainable development goals. The obvious <coughs> one is, of course, the trade-offs and synergies between the energy that we may need to use to keep people warm, cold, and you know, providing more quality, etc. There are other uh, issues to do with health inequalities, also whether materials that may be healthy uh, in a certain building may require, however, processes of extraction that make the, the populations where they are sourced uh, at risk in health terms or otherwise. Um, and in fact, um, at the global level, the environmental agenda and the health and well-being agenda are deeply linked and deeply, uh, deeply, deeply connected. 
uh, more broadly, there are very uh, many uh, ethical, political, policy, and philosophical implications of the health well-being and performance agenda in buildings that I can't go into. There are a couple of books that may also kind of help through some of these things. Uh, but my point here is that um, the professionals working in this field should really be aware of these ethical implications and then bring them into their uh, professional code of, uh, of practice. Uh, we talked about the third gap, so so far I talked about the, kind of va uh, the value of business gap and the uh, integrated design gap as well. There is of course an evidence gap that my, my other colleagues have talked through, so I will not expand too much. But there is definitely more data uh, needed on indoor exposures and also we need to, to define how to measure those exposures so that we can more meaningfully correlate them with the outcomes. And we need to agree what is the outcome, how do you measure productivity, how do you measure health and well-being in ways that are valuable, yes, of course, to academics, but ultimately also to stakeholders so that we can make a difference in practice. And finally, I should also say that there is um, a need to understand whether representative populations uh, can be found and the findings can be translated as well. So in, in summary, we need to understand how health well-being um, are conceptualized, measured, and valued by different stakeholders, and then source evidence that uh, is meaningful to build a business case. We need to develop new models of integrated building design and operation, and new professionals that can work across disciplines, including the technical and the humanities disciplines. To this end, we are launching a new MSC, starting in September 2017, uh, that uh, will form such a new generation of professionals. Uh, we have an advisory group of many of our members are here today, including some of our speakers, that are helping us ground the evidence uh, so that it is uh, relevant to industry. Uh, I will not go through the curriculum, but it's there so because the slides are available so you can look at them later. There are many ways to learn about this. We have a website, LinkedIn, Twitter account, and open days. Thank you very much.